hearts are gathered in his name, he's here with us. Two or three, got a bonus person. You're here, he's here in the midst of us. We're so grateful to the Lord for that. Oh, God has been so good to us, and we are so grateful to the Lord. And all of the blessings of the Lord, the scripture says, they make rich and add no sorrow. I'm thankful to the Lord for his blessings. Thank you all so much for all of your help this morning. I'm going to continue the series we've been start, we started last week called uh, Live Like Jesus or Living Like Jesus. We know that we want to live like Jesus every day. And giving our all to him means that we, we live our life for him, for him. One of the uh, things that we've been doing on Wednesday night, we're going to talk about the Beatitudes, getting that attitude of Christ, and then uh, Sunday morning is going to be the, uh, we're going to try to do our best to put those two together. Um, I mentioned this on Wednesday night, that as you walk down the hallway over to to, to the children's side, you'll see that there's four windows that are put there, and they represent the four desires for our church. We want our church to be a place of unity. We want our church to be a place of God's presence. We want our church to be a, a life-giving place where, where life is, is, is given. We also want to, want to make sure that we give love. We want to be a place of love. I, and I, I, I mentioned again, one of my prayers, I got it written out, and, and it, it, it's one of the prayers that I pray over and over again. I, it's my desire. I hope, and I've, I've the the. Really, the payoff of the whole thing is I've heard people say the same words back to me that had no clue that we've prayed this. That when people, first of all, we pray that when people drive up and down Maryville Road that they'd be drawn to this house. The second thing we pray is that when they drive on the parking lot that they feel the presence of God. Then when they walk in the doors, let them feel the love of God. The Lord's love through us. And the, the way he does that, it's through you and I. And it's, you know, people give off attitudes and spirits. You knew that, right? Yeah, just like you're doing right now. Yeah, you're You're giving off a spirit whether you know it or not. You you can either be friendly and open or you can be closed and bitter. I've had a, I've I've been around both. I'll tell you what, I, I like the loving and open part a whole lot better. The, uh. So today I want to continue on, and in regard to living like Jesus, I want to talk to you about forgiving people. Sometimes we hold things inside of us that, that maybe we don't even realize are affecting our lives and affecting the way that we, we view people. They don't even, real, don't even realize it's the way that we, we relate to them. It's because many times there's things that are in our hearts that have been trapped there that we have allowed to live there that shouldn't be. One of the uh, authors that I love to read because he's so easy to read is, uh, is Max Lucado. I'm sure that many of you have read uh, some of his books. And, and uh, one of the stories that he tells is about a... I, I can't even remember how old he was, maybe nine years old, little kid anyway. And, uh, and he asked for a, a dog for Christmas. And his parents bought him a Chinese pug. And he said that that little dog, he said that it came with a stipulation. This gift came with requirements. He said, the, the deal was, I'll get you a dog. However, you're going to water him. You're going to feed him. You're going to take care of him. You're going to clean up after him. You're going to give him a bath. You're going to take care of him all. And, and, you know, Max Clayton, he said, so as a kid, you know, I'm, oh, that's no problem. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And he said that, he said, my dad brought this little Chinese pug. He said it was so small, he could fit in my dad's hand. And he said, but, but he just stole my heart. When I saw him, that little, that little nose, and it, he said, and, and actually it was a, it was a girl, and because uh, he named, and, and I, forgive me for this, because this is just his story, and it's not my, he named the little dog Liz, and, and said, so, he said, I, I, I love this, he said, little, little Liz, he said, it was, it was so wonderful, because little, little Liz was mine now, and he said, and I would take her everywhere, I, I took her to bed with me, and you know, it was no big deal that I, I smelled like a dog, because it was cute, you know, and, and it was no big deal that, that, that she whined and whimpered, because, you know, she was mine, and, 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 and that little noise was so cute whenever she'd whimper. He said that when she did her business on my pillow, he said it was just so cute and, and so how adorable. She thought it was so cute because it was, that little Liz was mine. 
He said, according to our, our parents' agreement, he said, I had to do everything. I was obliged to, to feed her. He said, and sure enough, he said, every time she would take a little, little sip of water, he said, I'd be right there and I'd pour more water right in her dish. And he said, it was, it was amazing as I'd watch her and watch her go. And as soon as she'd eat, I'd want to give her a little bit more. She was mine. He said, however, he said, as I began to comb her hair and, and did all the little things that I could do, he said, over a, over a few days, he said, I realized my feelings were changing toward Liz. He says, Liz was my dog. She was still my dog, and I was, I was, still, I was still her caregiver, but I, get, I got a little weary of, of taking care of Liz. It seemed like she was always hungry now, always whimpering. More than once, he said, my parents reminded me. He said, it's your dog. You take care of her. He said, I didn't like hearing those words because I, 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 it just reminded me of the commitment that I made. He said, you go play with your dog. You clean up after your dog. In sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. <laughs> he said, this is what I love. He said in the story, he said, uh, he said I realized that I was stuck with Liz. He said, the courtship was over. Honeymoon was ended. He said, I was at the end of the leash. I, I, he said, I was out of options. He said, it was now, it was not an option anymore. It was an obligation. It was not a, it was not a pet anymore. She was now a chore. It was no longer somebody to play with. I now had to care for her. Chances are, you and I all recognize what it's like to have the claustrophobia of commitment, being stuck with, I mentioned this on Wednesday night, being stuck with people. Whenever we realize the permanence of our relationship, sometimes it puts us into a panic. And, you know, we have a, we have a, a choice on your paper there this morning. I want, you to, I want you to look. There's that first blank, and I want you to write these words. You see, we have a choice whenever we realize that we're... we're quote unquote stuck with people or we have stuck itis he said we we basically have a choice we can either flee or leave we can fight get mad get angry or number three we could forgive we can forgive Sometimes people opt, opt to flee and they opt to leave and they they go somewhere else and you let me just remind you that whenever you flee if you haven't dealt with the core issues, it will show up again. Oh, it's grass is always greener. That girl at the at the office, boy, she's perfect. That man at the office, he doesn't have any. His feet don't even stink. It's wonderful. <laughs> Let me remind you, if you don't deal with your issues, they'll show up again. Sometimes people fight, and so much so that their homes literally become a, a combat zone where every day it's just that adversarial relationship where, where people live with the ulcers. The other option is to forgive. You see, Jesus himself knew what it was like to be stuck with folks. He knew what it was like to have a permanence of relationship. Around the campfire there, there were the same dozen folks that were sitting there. The Peters, the, the, the James, the John, the Thomases, the, the Judas. Don't you know, every one of them, they, he put up with all of their uniquenesses or their oddities, rather. I guarantee it was difficult for him to know and, and, and to live with, with, with a guy named Peter because he knew that someday Peter would deny him. How difficult is it to live with a Judas and not expose him? How difficult is it to, to, to live with a Thomas that doubts everything you say? Or a John that's, that's ready to kill people at, the, at a moment's notice? Call down fire from heaven, God. Maybe you've got some hot-headed folks around you. Peter's going to slice a guy's ear off. Judas is going to betray me, and not just betray me with a kiss, he's going to betray me. So what do you do? When I talk about this, I realize that it's probably more painful for some than others. Today, perhaps you're having a difficult time. Let's con consider 
living like Jesus? How would Jesus do it? How was Jesus able to love his disciples? How can you and I do this? Look with me, if you will, to the book of John, chapter 13. Are you there? John 13. Verses 1 through 5. As we look at these verses, we see Jesus, this is toward the end of his ministry. This is as he is preparing to, to, uh, to be betrayed. He was pre- preparing to go to the cross. He was preparing. It says this, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them. Look at that. He loved them unto the end. He loved them. Verse 2. And the supper being ended... The devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God. Verse 4, it says, He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments. And he took a towel. He girded himself. Verse 5, after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Jesus. This was just before the Passover. This was just the, the time whenever he, he already recognized that his, he, he was going to the cross. He was going to be offered. And, and, and in this last Supper, this last time, he took a basin of water and washed their feet, washed the disciples' feet. You see, we know that, uh, that Jerusalem would have been packed with all kinds of Passover guests. It would have been just a, a, just a buzz of activity. And, and in the midst of all of the busyness, in the, in the midst of all of that, we know that Jesus himself was preparing for, for his own death. People... We're clamoring to just get a glimpse of him as his earthly ministry had reached a pinnacle and everybody knew him. That's Jesus. He decided that he wanted to be with his disciples. He wanted to be with them one more time. He wanted them to, to, to see his heart and to, to, to feel how, how he loved them. No doubt the, the streets were dusty and, and it was hot and, and it, was, uh, it was something that, that, that was very common for them to, to wash the feet but as, they, as they dined or after, before they dined typically, but no one had done it. The disciples entered one by one and they just plopped down at their table. I'm not the servant. Not my job. One by one, they all come in, they all sit down, all with dirty feet, dirty sandals, tracking it up. Towel hangs over there, that was clear. The basin was there. Jesus didn't bring it with him. But nobody did it. Anybody could have. Anybody could have got up and done it, but no one did. You see, Jesus knows what's needed. He knows what, what we have need of. And, and so Jesus stands and removes his outer garment and wraps himself in a, in, and girds himself with this towel and probably around his waist and kneels in front of each one of them and washes their feet. Can you imagine what it would be like? I don't know about you, but I'll tell you what, I'm not a real fan of people touching my feet. You might be, you might like the little pedicure stuff. I've tried it, I don't care for it. I was in California, let me just clarify. I figured nobody in there knew me. It was a strange place. I was spending a little girl time with my daughters. What else do you do? You get a pedicure, that's what you do. I didn't want them, I had already clipped my nails and pretty well bit off the rest of them, so I knew that they were good. However, the toes can always use some little, a little work. 
So I plopped down there. I'm not a real fan of all of that. I don't like people touching my feet. But you know what they do? They stick it in a bath there. I guess that's an antibacterial bath or something. Maybe it kills the odor or something. Boom! They put it right in. I don't know about you, but I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that. I don't like people touching my feet. But I can only imagine how it must have felt when not just anyone, but Jesus knelt down. Remove the sandals of each one of the disciples. Begin to bathe them, bathe their feet. What's so unique about this moment? Probably you and I have had, maybe you've had opportunities. Maybe it was the right before somebody was going off to school or taking a trip. and Maybe it was like whenever we drop Paige off at school, in college, you know, and, and you want to give them one last meal, one last time, just to spend some time together, to spend some moments of, uh, just to, so they'll know how much you love them. So you won't forget. Maybe it's right before they got married and you, and you wanted to have one last meal as a family before that, that in-law messes everything up. <laughs> and as you do, you gather there and you, you want it to be special. You don't want any outsiders. You, it's just us. That was such a moment. when Jesus wanted them, to, wanted them to know what he was really feeling toward them. As he took the basin, and one by one, he washed their feet. One by one. There's nothing more, you feel so vulnerable when another person is serving you. When they're, you're exposed and you're open. There in, in the midst of this, as the job that normally the lowest of the servants would get, Washing the feet. Now Jesus took and the same hands that had created the stars of heaven were now scrubbing the hands. The same, the same hands that healed the leper and the same hands that had touched those little children were now touching the feet of those old calloused disciples. He wanted them to know how much he loved them. You know, whenever you touch somebody, they can tell whether you love them or not. Have you ever had one of those touches when you knew you were in trouble? Usually it comes from the ear, you know. Yeah. That, that's not a loving touch. That's to straighten you out. Maybe even with a handshake you can feel. You, it's amazing when somebody touches you. Jesus here was bathing the feet of these disciples one by one, showing them, demonstrating to them, giving them. It, it, it's amazing. He didn't, it, it doesn't say for a moment, it doesn't say that he washed all the disciples' feet except for Judas. You and I maybe would have said, hey, you know what, I'll take care of the rest of them, but this guy's going to betray me. What good is he anyway? Just forget him. doesn't say that. It doesn't say that he, he stopped and said, you know what, let's, let's not do this guy because he, he's not really that important. We forget the Bartholomews. It was the hour before his own death. And he wasn't thinking of himself. He was only thinking of others. How, how many times has that ever happened to you? Whenever you stop thinking of yourself and, and only think of other people. Well, you're not concerned about your feelings. You're only concerned about them, and you want them to know. It doesn't happen very often, especially in our world. We want everybody, you take the towel. Jesus took the towel. I believe that if there's anything symbolic to this, I believe it's symbolic of Jesus washing the feet Washing our sins, washing us, washing us clean, taking the grubbiest parts of our life, taking the, the, the places where we have lived and walked. You see, whenever you look at a person's feet, you, it represents where they've walked, where they've been. And he took them 
and he washed them. If you look on down in those next verses, it says this. that He came to Simon Peter and he said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will. You'll understand. Then Peter said in verse 8, he said, no. He said, you'll never wash my feet, Jesus, unless I, unless I wash you. Jesus said, you won't have any part in me. I believe it's a picture of forgiveness. How could it be such a thing that Jesus would, would, would wash these old disciples' feet, even Judas? It reminds me of the scripture that says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, while we still messed up, while we, but before we even had any, any inkling of, of turning to him, he, he loved us. Christ died for us. You say, I could never do that. I could never forgive somebody like that. I could never, unless they ask and unless they do that, I could never do that. I, they've hurt me too deep. I believe that if there's anything that we're doing this morning, it's this, that Charlie already started with that forgiveness and Paula followed it up. I believe that there's something to this. I believe that this is an opportune moment. Whenever the Lord is already dealing, they didn't know what I was going to preach about. They must have, in the, in the heart of hearts, I believe that God is orchestrating a time. Are there things that you're holding in your heart that you need to release? You say, I can never do it if we're going to live like Jesus. Living like Jesus means that we forgive people. On your paper there, I want you to see the secret to this. The secret of forgiving is this. It's looking at Jesus instead of the one that hurt us. It's looking at Him, shifting our focus off the one that hurt us, off the, off the offense, and rather on to Jesus. He said if we, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus has cleansed us, cleanses us from all sin. Instead of looking at the offender, look at Jesus. Remember what he did. You see, our stories is, are, are the same. We weren't in Jerusalem that night. We weren't there as Jesus washed the disciples' feet. But Jesus cleanses us and cleanses our heart and takes the towel for us and shows us. You see, our, our Savior knelt down and gave his life. He gazed into our eyes and took away all of the sin. You say, I could never do that. Well, that's where you're wrong because Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says that he lives inside of us. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Maybe in yourself you can't forgive. In our flesh, we want to get revenge. In our, in our flesh, we say, forget the towel. I throw in the towel. But Jesus took it. Because he forgives us, we can forgive him. And we can forgive them. You, John chapter 13 and verses 14 and 15. Notice the words that, that Jesus said. He, he said this, If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. I don't believe for a moment, you know, I realize that in the past, as a matter of fact, I remember us having the foot washing, you know, along with communion. You'd have the foot washing. It's more than just that. It's cleansing of yourself. I don't believe it's, not, it's just this. I believe it's a literal cleansing of, our, of ourselves, saying, you know what, I don't have anything. I serve you. Right. I give them myself. I've left you an example. Not only does the Lord do this, I believe He does this for two things. He shows us, number one, He shows us His mercy by washing the feet, but He also gives us a message. And that message is His unconditional love that He gives to all of us, the grace that He gives to all of us. The message is clear. He gives us mercy. He gives us a message. The mercy of Christ preceded our mistakes before we were even thinking about him he was already thinking about us those in christ's circle had no doubt about his love they didn't have any doubt that he loved them with an everlasting love what does it mean to live like jesus what does it mean it means to have a heart like his 
It means to be touched, touching even the grimy parts of, of, of people you're stuck with and, and washing the, 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 the sins and washing all the unkindness and washing all of the filth and the, and the hurt and the pain and saying, you know what? I forgive it. I look to Jesus. He is my example. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. He says this, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Whenever we understand that this is the message that he came to give. Christ forgave us. How much more should we forgive others? As a matter of fact, the Lord's Prayer, you remember it was preceded with a, with a pretty strong command. He said, if you don't forgive, you cannot be forgiven. Not my words, those are His. Why? It's because His heart doesn't live in you if there isn't forgiveness. If I'm going to live like Jesus, it means that, that I literally live like Him. Give like Him. Give the life that He gave. Philippians 2, verse 5 through 8 says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who be in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men and fashioned as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. But he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything. He didn't, he wasn't the guilty one. You see, the the message is this. Jesus washed the feet of the guilty. He washed the feet of the, of the people that didn't deserve it. He washed the thing. Anybody would salute those that salute you back. Anybody, a publican, a sinner would do that. That's not Christ-like. Loving those that love you. He said, this is where it really is found. He said, when you love people that don't love you. You remember what he said about, about, about doing good to those who hate you and, and praying for those that despitefully use you? Do you think he put that in there just to sound real good? No. It was because of you and I. You see, I was guilty. And I had no hope. I had no way of attaining But Jesus came and washed my feet, cleansed me, became a servant for my sin. He washed the feet of the guilty, took the the sin and the shame and the degradation. I read a story of of a husband that had been unfaithful for decades. And through a series of events, uh, his wife found out. They had gone to counseling, and as they, as they went to counseling, they, they, the, the counselor suggested that they go away, that they, that they take some time, several days together, and, and try to reconnect, and try to, try to do this. And as they, as they took time away, they dropped everything, and they went, and they, they walked and talked, they reflected, they rehearsed all of the, 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 the early days. The, life, the wife could have left. The husband was guilty. He didn't deserve another chance. He had sinned. He had committed adultery. She could have stayed and made him pay every day. (laughs) I'll teach you, buddy. Story is told that as the nights went on, they got to the very last night that they were to be away. And on the husband's pillow, there was a card that was written these very simple words. It was this, I'd rather do nothing with you all day than anything without you. I forgive you. I love you. Let's move on. You see, that card was a basin of forgiveness. She took the towel. She did the the giving, the washing. There are some situations that only this can 
take care of the problem. The forgiveness. The giving of their self. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did when he came to the cross? As we lead up to this time, whenever we, we, we are celebrating resurrection, think of what Jesus did. Didn't he write in his own blood those same words? I would rather do nothing without you than anything. Than anything. I want you. I want you above everything. I don't want to do anything without you. I don't want to, I don't want to have that, this life without you. You see, because man had sinned and come short of the glory of God. God could have easily recreated mankind. He could have started all over. He could have said, forget it, it's not worth it. After Adam sinned, he could have quit. At the flood, he could have quit. Anywhere along the line, the Tower of Babel, he could have said, this is it. Before Jesus ever came. But he came because he said, you know what, I don't want to live without them. I know they messed up. I know they're flawed. I know all the stuff, but I want them. That's how much every one of us, we don't deserve it. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Is he stuck with me? I'm part of his creation. But never a moment does he feel, make me feel like he's stuck with me. You see, there's something that's stronger than even a boy's love for a dog. And that's the master and the savior of the world. The way he loves mankind. You and I. He gave himself a ransom that we can have life. How much more should we forgive? How much more? So we live like Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, your word says, scarcely for a righteous man would one die, but while we were yet sinners, you died for us. There are people here today, Lord Jesus, in this very room that you love so much that you love and gave yourself for him, for them. Us, Lord. Every one of us have sinned. Not one of us deserve, and we could never deserve or earn your salvation, but you came and you lavished your love upon us. God, I pray in the sacredness of this moment that you would deal with every heart in life. I pray that you would draw your people. Draw those ones that have walked away. Draw those ones, Lord God, that are today recognized that they need a Savior. Draw them to your heart, we pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.